Chef Kwame. What's that? Tatiana has pulled off something really unusual. You know, it, it, it radiates the sense of New York. Like, it's very, very New York-y. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, or, or not but, it's like, and. And it's Nigerian. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, Creole. And maybe, I think... Maybe Caribbean. Ca Caribbean, too. What have you learned about the way that your customers respond to, to like, to telling stories, to storytelling, and, and to your personal approach? When we put a new dish on the menu, we have a menu matrix, we call it, and it tells the story of the dish, the origins of the dish, and it's just for the service to know, because I feel like when a dish tells a story, it has a soul. You're not just cooking for perfect seasoning, you're cooking to share something with someone, nostalgia, a story, a memory, a feeling. And it's easier to get the team behind it when there's intentionality behind it. At age 10, your mom, Jewel, mm -hmm. she sends you to live with your grandfather in, in Nigeria. For, I think it's supposed to be a first summer, but it's like two, two years you stay. But then you come home and she's like, she's struggling. She's, she's a caterer, mm -hmm. but she's struggling. You, you write in the book, my mother just wasn't making enough money to survive. What impact do you think that that, that combination, your, your departure, her struggle, Maybe, maybe your guilt. What impact do you think that that has had on, on, on your career? I think it's given me tenacity and, and drive to not return back to that lifestyle that I grew up in. Worrying about the lights being on, you know, worrying about where I'm gonna get my next meal. You know, it's something that I have a memory of that. So I think it pushed me to just get as far away from that as possible, and, and, and by any means possible. The moment of the book that stands out, at the time you're, you're in a gang, you're young, you're like, uh, you, you buy a gun, I think you're like 16, and there's a guy, I mean, he's a, he's a friend, he takes the gun, mm -hmm. he points it at your chest, uh -huh. he pulls the trigger, I, I think like multiple times. Uh -huh. How does that experience, and others like it, like change you? And, and, and how do you keep it with you now? It was, you know, it was scary. It was just really scary. We're kids though, so it, I don't think I felt the gravity of it, you know, until later, but um, yeah, it was scary. But there was a lot of scary moments growing up where I grew up. You know, being shot at is more scary than that to me. So um, I don't know, I guess it, it made me tougher. I, I, Wish I didn't go through that, but it is what it is. When I think back about like the the mood of the early restaurants that you worked in, like some of the best restaurants in the world, per se, Eleven Madison, you describe like very cold, almost kind of like like loud, angry, like um, maybe even a little bit cruel. Mm -hmm. What have you done to make your kitchen different than that? You know, I try to treat people like human beings. Um, I try to have a lot of empathy um, and compassion. And also, you know, I try to mentor in, in the best ways that I can. You know, it's, I think it's really difficult being a leader in a kitchen. For a restaurant, we get an assignment every seven minutes and we have seven minutes to deliver on that. So it's, you know, it's high stakes and you do your best. And I think with focusing on the culture of the kitchen, and just trying to make, trying to think about them as individuals Ch changes the, the, the dynamic in the kitchen. Speaking of your journey, your first restaurant, Shabiju. So it closed, then you become the executive chef at Kithkin. Mm -hmm. You win James Beard, Rising Star Award, big, big deal, big stuff. But you left. My understanding is that it wasn't just COVID that you wanted a stake in the restaurant, an inequity stake, and the owners were like, nope, so you left. Mm -hmm. How did you approach Tatiana differently? I mean, yeah, I came in with my terms and that was that was just that, you know, I, I didn't want to get back into the restaurant game unless I had an, a large equity st uh, stake in it. You know, I was going to be pouring my my culture into it and my my heart and my emotions. So that was really, really important to me. It seems to me that 
don't know. I feel like it, it might not actually be true, but I feel like what, what you hear when you're in New York is that like restaurants are like just like a terrible business to be in, like very, very hard. Can you tell us like the most powerful thing you've learned about surviving and succeeding in it? I'm thinking like not just as a chef who makes food, but as a, as, as a businessman. Yeah, I mean, it is a terrible business. You know, they're right. It's very, very difficult. But, you know, there's a certain group of people that actually love operating them. And it's for us. You know, we, we bring people together. It's a gathering spot at the end of the day. Nobody that's coming to a restaurant is starving. You know, they're not on a soup line. They're there for an experience. They're there to meet someone for the first time. They're there to mourn. They're there for a first date. They're there to celebrate. The reviews are great, you know, when they come in and they're good. But like every single day when people are meeting and they're excited and they're happy, um, that's part of the magic for me. Thank you so much, Chef, for being here. Of course, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Watch The Business Week Show Thursday nights, 1030 Eastern on Bloomberg Television or 830 on Bloomberg.com or the Bloomberg app on Connected TVs.